Well, it's four in the morning in Hong Kong, and extraordinarily, in the next few minutes, its chief executive, Carrie Lam, is going to give a press conference. We'll bring that live to you here on Outside Source, of course, as bringing you the story of the last 24 hours and all the latest analysis. So it's four o'clock in the morning in Hong Kong and the fallout from the storming of the parliament continues. We're expecting to hear, as I was saying, from Chief Executive Carrie Lam in the next few minutes. As soon as she starts speaking, we'll, of course, listen to that. But first of all, we have the story of how these protests escalated so quickly from peaceful protests out on the streets to violent protests inside the parliamentary building. While well, the protesters have left, they did so several hours ago because around midnight local time, this happened. The riot police turned up and they stormed the building known as the LegCo, the Legislative Council. Now, Monday was the anniversary of Hong Kong's handover to Chinese rule. There are demonstrations every year, but we've not seen anything like this. The BBC's Nick Beak has been covering the story all day. I'm going to play you numerous reports from Nick at different stages of this story. But first of all, let's hear an update I got off him just a few minutes ago. We're outside the LegCo building now. We've been into the, the main chamber and saw the... I'm going to come straight off that report from Nick and let's listen to Carrie Lam. So this is Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong. What she would normally do in these situations would speak in two languages. So we think she'll make a short statement and then she'll make a short statement in English. So we're going to keep listening in. And of course, everyone's watching very carefully to see what her response will be. The police tactics today have been highly unusual. They did nothing to stop the protesters attacking the outside of the parliament's building. They did nothing to stop the protesters going into the parliamentary chamber and vandalizing it. And even more curiously, they did nothing to stop the protesters leaving before the police went in. All highly unusual. And now we're looking to see what the political response is going to be because there will be decisions not just for Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, who we can see here, but also for the government in Beijing. Because while Carrie Lam denies that, for instance, this extradition bill, which began these latest series of protests, was ordered by Beijing, the protesters very much see her, in their words, as being a puppet of Beijing. And so it'll be interesting to see what the response from Carrie Lam is, and what the response from Beijing is and the degree to which they are coordinated. But there are going to be some very big decisions for Carrie Lam to take because clearly there have been a number of illegal acts that have occurred today with the storming of Parliament and the authorities will have decisions about how to go about finding the people who carried this out and if they deem it necessary, punishing the people who carried this out. Let's just listen in a little bit further to what Carrie Lam so Laura Westbrook has just been in Hong Kong for two weeks covering this story for the BBC. She's here with me on Outside Source. So this is standard, isn't it? They do a bilingual press conference. Yeah, I've uh, seen a few of these, um, including when she announced that this bill is going to be suspended. They'll speak in Cantonese and then they'll speak in English. It is interesting to note that Carrie Lam has been very much missing from the public eye. She hasn't been in public for 10 days now. And it's one of the reasons why there has been such a level of anger in Hong Kong. People have said that they've been taking to the streets in peaceful protest, including the largest protest of, on Hong Kong's history, where 25% of the population of Hong Kong, according to organizers, came out in protest. And they, and still Carrie Lam, and the Hong Kong government has ignored them. She's kept out of the public eye. 
And today she's finally coming out to face the media at four in the morning. Can you think of that? <laughs> can you think of this ever happening before? No. A press conference in the middle of the night? No, but I think it is everything that's happened in Hong Kong today has been unprecedented. Storming of Parliament is completely unprecedented. I've never seen that anything level like the level of violence that you've seen today. And so having Carrie Lam come out at four in the morning, it must mean that she feels she needs to come out and face the media because she's been hiding from the media for the last 10 days. And in terms of the policing, I was alluding to it earlier, it was unusual compared with previous police tactics that we've seen. Who would have made the decision about how this was policed? Would it be the head of police? Would it be Carrie Lam? How does it work in Hong Kong? So Hong Kong has a separate uh, police uh, system. It's part of the Hong Kong's one country, two systems. I imagine that's, this would have come from the very top, though. And it seems to be a deliberate tactic because of the level of um, anger against police in those clashes we saw two weeks ago on a Wednesday, that people were very angry about the police, um, what they said was saw as police brutality. So it seems a deliberate tactic of the police today that they have very much kept back. They've retreated until later this evening. And the police have just started talking. Let's just bring the sound up. So they're still speaking in Cantonese. So we're going to keep listening to this because uh, this is, just in case you're joining us, right in the middle of the night, 4 a.m. in Hong Kong. But Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, has decided it's appropriate to have a press conference now. And it's not a surprise to see the police there because there are so many questions about the decisions that they made in the last 24 hours. Yes, and they have come out um, and, and called the people who uh, stormed Hong Kong's parliament a mob. Um, it is worth noting as well that if they characterize what happened today a riot, people could get up to 10 years in prison. So. A lot of people have been saying that the young people in Hong Kong have been risking their futures mm. by going into Hong Kong's parliament and, uh, and vandalizing it to such a massive extent. And in your two weeks out there, when did you get back? Not very long ago. Yesterday. Couple, yesterday, <laughs> okay, so you're just back. Did you meet anyone who had the ambition to use violence in this way to drive change in Hong Kong? There are pockets of what we call more radical protesters within the wider protest group who see that when there has been violence by the police, public opinion does swell in support for these protests. But I think what we're seeing today is a bit of a turning point because um, people in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is known as the city of protest, it's the city of peaceful protest, and to have these young people storm uh, the centre of Hong Kong and Hong Kong's parliament, I think you might start seeing that this might be termed a mistake by a lot of um, people. Uh, we're seeing uh, some divisions b within the pan-democratic camp, the opposition mm -hmm. camp, who are saying that the support which has largely been behind these protesters might start to turn away because of the level of violence that we've seen today. And it will be interesting to see if that does happen. I guess it's difficult to judge, though, because people are unlikely to say out loud they support violence, even if perhaps behind closed doors they do. It's difficult to gauge, isn't it? Yes, of course. Now, as we're talking, let's bring in Kerry Allen, who's from BBC Monitoring, often helps us out covering stories from China and how it's covered in the Chinese media. Just while we're listening to this press conference in Cantonese, and by the way, if you're watching, it's going to switch to English, and when it does, of course, we'll listen in. Um, it's in Cantonese. Will it be broadcast anywhere in China? Presumably not. No, not at all, no. Um, I mean, obviously, with, with mainland China, you'll always have a delay on stories like this, and the Communist Party will um, decide its own take on on these events. So, yeah, they'll be waiting um, probably a day, that normally happens, um, in order to um, issue their own response. What there will be is an emphasis on these acts of hooliganism, um, which, um, well, rioting and basically, you know, uh, smashing the windows of parliament. And these very much play very much into the Communist Party's hands because that's been the message that they've been putting about, that, um, that the protests are not peaceful um, and they've been choosing certain elements where they show there are basically acts of vandalism in Hong Kong and they strongly can but as such, some of the more extraordinary video that's been widely shared showing shopping trolleys and other implements being used to smash the glass at the front of the building. Would any of that be available on Weibo? Actually, before you answer that, let me... Nope, still no English. Sorry, Kerry, carry on. Would they? Yeah. Would those clips be available in social media on, in China? Probably not, no. no. Um, there, there might be images in uh, Hong Kong papers that are seen as pro-Beijing um, tomorrow that show acts of vandalism. But, but yeah, the ideas of, like, you know, the images of people with umbrellas, um, basically, you know, peaceful protests, the artwork that's been 
trending on platforms like Twitter, for example, and Instagram. Mm. These these won't function. You know, people won't see these in in mainland China at all. There'll be absolute suppression. But in Hong Kong, Laura, presumably this kind of material could be widely shared without the state getting involved. Well,、um, we we're seeing that this press conference is being streamed live on Twitter right, right. now.、Um, one of the pictures that I saw tonight, which really struck me, was a picture of、uh, the police looking at a pillar with、um, graffiti on it, and it said, "You told me that peaceful protest does not work," and that was a really, I think, quite striking image and an image of. The scenes that we've seen today, that people, a lot of these young people feel ignored by the government, government feel ignored by Carrie Lam, feel ignored by their signs of peaceful protest. What they want is for this bill to be withdrawn, and that has been ignored for weeks. And the level of violence and frustration we've seen today, I think, has reached boiling point, and that's what we saw in those scenes today. But just for everyone listening to you, while we. So those you turning on. This is a press conference from Carrie Lam, chief executive of Hong Kong. Middle of the night after the Hong Kong Parliament was stormed a few hours ago by protesters.、Um, in terms of the extradition bill. It's been paused, though, hasn't it? So the protesters did get something for their efforts. They got a major climb down.、Um, the government, up up until you know, quite a few weeks ago, Carrie Lam was adamant she was going to push this bill through no matter what. Then she came out in a press conference saying it's being suspended, and she said it's not coming back this uh, uh, term. So it's、mm -hmm. not coming back this year.、Um, the term ends in July next year,、um, and she said it's very much been. Paused, but what people are saying, and what, and this is what feeds into the heart of the issue here, it's that this bill could come back, and if it does come back, then it will effectively、uh, be the biggest challenge to the freedoms that Hong Kong enjoys under one country, two systems. And everyone that I've spoken to has said they are worried about how this bill could affect them personally.、Mm -hmm. And so, while a lot of people won't support the violence that we've seen today, the broader support for the, the Complete withdrawal of this bill, that will have some broader support amongst people in Hong Kong. Some of the news agencies are translating some of what we're hearing from Carrie Lam. We're told that she's condemned the extremely violent storming of Parliament. Well, that much we would have expected, but of course we're looking for more detail on how she plans to respond and also how she justifies the way this was policed. Carrie, in terms of how this story is being told in mainland China, we've talked quite a few times in the last month because the narrative around these protests in Hong Kong has has evolved somewhat in the the English language Chinese media. You've been telling us it has, yeah. I mean, when these protests originally started in、uh, in early July,、um, there was just absolute clampdown. There was no mention of them whatsoever. There was the hope they'd just go away. Obviously. Uh, nearly a million people took out took to the streets.、Um, so、um, you know, it was a case of、oh, okay, you know, maybe we have to acknowledge them in some shape or form. So English language media were starting to talk about yeah acts of hooliganism, for example. But、uh, when Carrie Lam, in the middle of June,、um, in middle of June, decided to basically suspend the bill,、um, then it was blamed on the U.S. and it almost tied into the whole U.S.-China trade war. That、uh, basically it was external interference in domestic Chinese affairs. I mean, this is the line that came up quite a bit.、Mm -hmm. Um, and today, being a big, you know, big deal that it's the handover of the anniversary, it's also the 98th anniversary of the Communist Party. There's there's a lot of emphasis in China on the strength of of the Communist government, and、uh, and basically、um, the idea that、um, you know that, that Hong Kong is a part of China and、uh, and that won't change, and that you know Chinese strength is shown in that way.、Um, Laura, just before we start playing some of the. Material that we have from earlier in the day and the story of what happened with these protests.、Um, in terms of what happens next, are protesters planning to turn out when the sun will be up, not in in an hour or two?、Um, are there more plans for more protests? One of hold on, hold that thought, Laura. We think she's talking English. Let's have a listen in. <laughs> Oh, okay. okay.、Uh, let me let me just repeat、uh, very briefly what I have said、uh, in Cantonese.、Um, on the first of July, that is the、uh, 22nd anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, we have seen two entirely different public scenes. One is、um, regular march on the first of July, regardless of the number of participants in a march. The march was peaceful and generally orderly, and this、uh, fully reflects the inclusiveness of Hong Kong society and the core values we attach to peace and order. 
The second scene that we have seen, which really saddens a lot of people and shocks a lot of people, is the extreme use of violence and vandalism by protesters who stormed into the Legislative Council building、um, over a period of time. So、uh, this is something that、uh, we should seriously condemn, because nothing is more important than the rule of law in Hong Kong. So I hope the、uh, community at large will agree with us that with these violent acts that we have seen, it is right for us to condemn it and hope society will return to normal as soon as possible. <laughs> Why there were no police officers inside the Ashcroft building? What kind of games is the police playing? Are you setting a trap for the protesters? And Mr. Slam, sorry, I have, I have a second question for you. Do you feel that personally you are responsible for the violence and that because of your lack of positive response to the protesters' demands? Thank you. Okay. Uh, let, let me answer first. I totally disagree、uh, what、um, this gentleman has just、uh, said. We have officers inside the Lechco defending Lechco for nearly eight hours. During the period,、uh, we have been under siege of the、um, protesters. They keep on using、uh, violent tactics to try to intrude into the、uh, Lechco. It is not. It is only until nine o'clock at night time.、Uh, there were several incidents happen that make、uh, that we have to do a temporary、uh, retreat. First of all,、uh, there were many protesters outside、um, the Lechco、uh, main entrance, and they are starting、uh, using violent tactics、uh, to uh, charge uh, the inner、uh, door of the、uh, Lechco. Secondly,、um, due to the、um, uh, local environment,、um, the, uh, that uh, we are unable uh, to use uh, some of the force that we can use in open ground. And thirdly, we found that there were some protesters tampering with the electricity box, and we find that some of the lights have gone out. And in fear of a total blackout. That the protester, while charging in, someone turn off the light. I'm afraid that there will be、um, people stabbing people, or there will be、um, a wrong move on either side, both the police and the protester. And lastly, but not the least, during the charging, they throw in some、uh, white smoke. That,、uh, as you know, in the afternoon, there were already a, a toxic、uh, powder. Um, attack on my officer in the afternoon. So, without knowing whether this is another toxic、uh, powder attack, we have no other choice but to temporarily retreat from Lechco. And before we retreat, we have already、um, in the afternoon, four o'clock, we have、uh, asked the、uh, Lechco security to、um, appeal to all working staff within the Lechco. Uh, to leave、uh, Lechco due to the、um, the incident,、um, the charging by the protester, and by the time nine o'clock, we are have, we have been told that all working staff have left. That that means that we are sure there is no other civilian within the building. So our op, my officers have no choice but to temporarily retreat and to do a regrouping and try to redeployment,、uh, do some redeployment to take back. Let's go later on. It is、uh, so sorry. Sorry. Well,、uh, it is not true to say that the government has not responded.、Um, we have not responded to every demand asked because of、uh, good reasons. Now, first of all,、uh, if the cause of the social tensions that we have seen is a bill to amend the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance. On the 15th of June, I have announced the suspension of the bill, and subsequently we have explained and elaborated 
by suspending the bill at this point in time with no timetable and no plan to resume the debate of the bill in the Legislative Council. The bill will expire or the bill will die in July 2020 when the current legal term expires. That is a very positive response to the demands that we have heard. As for some of the other demands, let me come back to this very important principle of the rule of law. So demand the government to release without any investigation and checking with the uh, law about whether offences have been made, that we should release everybody uh, arrested. We should not take any follow-up action against some of the violent acts we have seen or even to grant an amnesty to all those involved in these protests. All these responses will not be in accordance with the rule of law. So the rule of law is exactly what I have been talking uh, tonight. So I hope we all agree that this is something of paramount importance to Hong Kong and will continue to guide the government's reactions and responses to social issues and to demands and aspirations of our people. <laughs> So as you can hear, the press conference with Carrie Lam and the police chief in Hong Kong has switched back to Cantonese. We're going to continue to listen uh, to what's being said. As and when they go back to English, we will, of course, bring it to you live. But let's, first of all, just go through a number of important statements that we've heard from Carrie Lam. She's the chief executive of Hong Kong and also from the police chief. And it's also, first of all, just worth pausing for a moment to think that we've just heard the chief of police in Hong Kong talk about reclaiming the parliamentary building. I mean, Laura, you have to kind of listen to that a couple of times to realize you're, you're saying it out loud. They lost control. Yeah, and he also gave um, an indication of why they didn't move in until later. He said that they were not sure that there were civilians who were with the protesters, and so they wanted to make sure that um, before they cleared the building. But he, was also, he also called it a siege, and it is the most important thing, though, is he said that these protesters are rioters, and that characterization of this as a riot means that people could be prosecuted for up to 10 years in prison. And also, Carrie Lam just emphasized that the idea that everyone should be given an amnesty is not you know, in line with the rule of law in Hong Kong and seemed to immediately dismiss that idea. So some of the key uh, demands of these protesters is this bill be withdrawn, people have been arrested, be released, and to not characterize the Wednesday's protest of two weeks ago a riot. She's very much dug in tonight. She said that this, she's already said that this bill has been suspended, that she, um, it won't come back this year. But she's refusing to use that, that word, which is what protesters want, which is withdrawn, um, which would be a major step down. Um, and, but, and what she's saying, that it's not coming back this year, but it doesn't mean it can't come back in one year or two years or three years. And that's what people are very worried about. Laura, you're with us through this edition of Outside Source. You just got back after two weeks reporting in Hong Kong. Kerry's from BBC Monitoring always helps us with Chinese media uh, perspectives on this. What did you make of that press conference? Um, just the, I mean, a lot of the language that she uses is very in line with what the Communist Party would show. So, uh, I mean, basically, she wasn't making any, um, any basically any concessions for protesters um, whatsoever. You know, the emphasis more than anything was on, um, you know, the, the condemnation of people using violent kind of methods in order to uh, to attack the building and such like this. I mean, even if. You know that back on the 15th, you know that behaviour mm. might be overlooked or kind of, you know, after the extradition bill pulled through. Um, I mean, one of the things I was also conscious of is the fact that, you know, the press conference was given; it wasn't surrounded by graffiti showing the effects. Um, so it means that um, the communist media in mainland China can actually use this and uh, and handpick these kind of 
um, statements about um, you know how she will not tolerate violent attacks within Hong Kong and how this is looked down upon I mean this will be used to tie into the dialogue within mainland China that um, that basically it's hooliganism it's uh, it's violence um, it's not peaceful protests one of the accusations that a lot of the protesters have is that the government talks up and it doesn't talk doesn't listen down to the protesters and I think that's very much what you're seeing now it's Carrie Lam talking to Beijing yeah. it's Carrie Lam um, not listening again which is the uh, accusation from the protesters saying she's not listening to them and that's I think very much what you're seeing right now Laura and Kerry, you're going to be with us for the next 30 minutes. We're going to be with you for the next 30 minutes as we continue to bring you ongoing coverage of the situation in Hong Kong. So the chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, has been speaking in a middle-of-the-night press conference. Here's some of what she said. Nothing is more important than the rule of law in Hong Kong. So I hope the uh, community at large will agree with us that with these violent acts that we have seen, it is right for us to condemn it and hope society will return to normal as soon as possible. <laughs> Here's one tweet reacting to that. Chris Cheng is from the Hong Kong Free Press. He says, 2014 Occupy Movement, no investigation, protesters were charged and jailed. 2016 Mong Kok clashes, no investigation, protesters were charged and jailed. No one expects Carrie Lam to do anything different, not just about her decision, but Beijing will hardly agree to any concession too. Well, let's talk to uh, the BBC's Kerry Allen from BBC Monitoring, Laura Westbrook, based here in London, but just been in uh, Hong Kong for a couple of weeks reporting. Um, the relationship between Beijing and Hong Kong is always a difficult one to pin down, Kerry. It is, yes. Um, and well, Beijing basically makes the point again and again that Hong Kong is an area that belongs to China and, and no more so than, you know, the anniversary of handover today, the idea that... Um, that basically, um, well also it's the, it's the Communist Party's 98th anniversary as well. So what it does, I mean I've just been checking the newspapers mm. in, um, in both mainland China and Hong Kong today. Um, so there's uh, basically, there's very little mention of this because mainland China, Beijing sees Hong Kong as basically like a small region. So you know, its politics are kind of regional politics. So they'll never be given a lot of attention. Um, as, as big a scale as they get really. Mm. So, um, so there's not a lot of coverage of um, of, of what's been happening today, if any at all, really. And very interesting to hear you say that because on uh, a lot of the walls of uh, the Legislative Council it says Hong Kong is not China. And so the view in Hong Kong is very much we are part of the one country, two systems principle. We want to keep the freedoms we have in Hong Kong that is separate to the mainland. And uh, they want to do everything that they can to defend those freedoms for as long as possible. What did you make of what we heard from Carrie Lam and the police chief? What would you pick out as being the most significant parts of that? Uh, there are two things. The first is that she very much has dug in. She's not used that crucial word, withdrawal, which is what all the protesters, it's the biggest demand the protesters have said. They want this bill withdrawn. They don't want it suspended. She said, look, it's not going to come back this year. They're saying, but that doesn't mean it could come back later. Um, so she's very much dug in, refused to give in to a key demand. The second thing is, and I think this gives an indication of what could happen in the future is she was emphasizing the rule of law. Hong Kong is a lawful society, Hong Kong has rule of law and I think that gives us an indication of what could happen because if this protest is, is, is characterized a riot and it has it could carry up to 10 years in prison and so a lot of these protesters they, they might be facing serious jail time and when we think about how young they are um, this is the future of many of their many of their futures uh, could be in jeopardy. Okay, Laura and Kerry, thank you very much for the moment. Those of you watching, if you've got questions about what's happening in Hong Kong, send them our way. Uh, you can see the email and the hashtag on the screen, and Laura and Kerry are staying with us across the edition. Now, the BBC's Nick Beak has been right at the centre of this story for across the last 24 hours. About an hour ago, I spoke to him from inside the Parliament's building.
We're outside the LegCo building now. We've been into the, the main chamber and saw the destruction, really, and the debris that was left behind. The police have been asking people to come down to this point, and you can see some of the graffiti behind us, the smashed glass, as far as the eye can see, really. And this gives you an indication of how these protesters were able to make their way indoors and were able to occupy this building in, in, in an incredible fashion. And of course, they were able to do that because the police did not stop them. You can see some officers now, they've taken off their riot gear, and no more shields, no more batons, no more spray. Some people may say, too little, too late, why did they not better protect this building? But I think it might have been a decision that they stood back and can now say, look at what these protesters have done, look what they've done to the parliament, look what they've done to the assembly of the people of Hong Kong. And behind you, Nick, I can see some graffiti saying Hong Kong is not China, and I guess that cuts to the heart of the motivation of these protesters. Yeah, I mean, absolutely right, Ross. This was initially a deep-rooted anger about a specific law which might see people sent to mainland China to face trial. But talking to people today, there is a real anti-Beijing sentiment. Many of the people, teenagers in their early 20s, they do not want a future which is dictated to by Beijing. They don't want the lives that they lead in the future to be the same as people on mainland China. And so really that has been powering this protest, powering this movement. And I think it has become a movement fueled through social media. Fascinating to see how people react not to someone with a loudspeaker, but to a message they get on their phone. In particular, the Telegram social media app has been one way that people have been sent instructions. And it's incredible to watch a whole group of people, hundreds, look at their phone. They see where they're being instructed to go next and they just leave. Like that, they've gone. And of course, it's really difficult for the police, who are here now, to try and cope with that, predict where people will go, and it'd be interesting also to see how they react in the coming days. So they try and track down the people who burst through the barricades here today and caused such embarrassment for the authorities here in Hong Kong, and of course, embarrassment for Beijing too. Nick, can you give us an idea of the geography of how far these protesters had to go from the street to actually get into the chamber, into the assembly? Yeah, let's try and give you that um, indication, Ross. I mean, just over there, beyond some of the officers, you can see the lights of a few vehicles. So it wasn't particularly far, but the tactic that they picked up from about midday was to try and broach lots of different uh, entrances, try and get through a number of different places. Eventually, they did that. But they, they waited, they bided their time, and you saw a huge number of people channel themselves through this particular entrance. So the crowds build up, and they had a, a real body of numbers who were then able, en masse, to push through this particular spot. So even though this is the main entrance to the assembly here, which you thought would be really, really well protected, they were able to smash through, and then they made their way up the stairs, up the escalators, which had been turned off, and went into that chamber that we saw earlier, where it's now uh, like, like a bomb site. You've got food all over the place, water, uh, umbrellas, all the um, detritus, all the debris that the, the protesters brought with them. So this is the legacy of an extraordinary day here in Hong Kong. Well, let's take you through how we went from peaceful protests at the beginning of this day to graffiti on the walls of the parliamentary chamber. Bear in mind, for the past month, there have been protests in Hong Kong about this bill that would allow people in Hong Kong to be extradited to mainland China. Those protests have been huge and largely peaceful. Well, today's was also enormous. Organisers say they believe half a million people turned out. We can't verify that, but you can see for yourself that there were an awful lot of people turning out. This drone footage also gives you an idea of the amount of protesters who came out to mark this anniversary. Now, protesters also blocked main roads, and this appears to have been the place where the flashpoints occurred. Police used pepper spray and batons to try and clear people. We know some officers were injured after protesters threw an unknown liquid at them. And after that, some of the protesters, a small number of them compared with the scale of that protest, broke away and they moved towards the LegCo building. This is the Parliament building. And they at first used this shopping trolley to try and smash through the reinforced glass at the front of the building. There was no police resistance. Some of the protesters got inside. Now, it's worth saying, the LegCo, the Legislative Council, was put on red alert and evacuated. That's never happened before. And Nick Beek 
was there when it was happening. Well, you can see once again this hardcore of demonstrators are going once again at the window. There's a projectile there. It's a pole that they want to smash through the glass. And if you take a quick look, they've already made quite a lot of damage. You can see it frosted that reinforced glass, but yet they're coming time and again. So far, the riot police haven't moved in. You can see someone taking matters into his own hands. This is something which will be seen around the world. It's deeply embarrassing for the Hong Kong authorities. Embarrassing for Beijing too, because remember, this is their day as they would see it, the 22nd anniversary of the handover from British rule to China. And yet this is happening on their doorstep. This is a city where the anger is palpable. If the authorities thought it would go away, well, it hasn't. And once again, people have come onto the streets. In terms of the wider public sympathy, what will the older generation think? These are mainly students here today. We ask them, why are you here? They say, we fear for our future. We want a revolution, but will other Hong Kongers go with them? And I think we move back now because once again, they're going to be trying to make their way through this door. While that was happening, the protesters put out a statement online attacking Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, who we've just heard give a press conference, uh, and who supported that extradition bill which began the protests a few weeks ago. Um, in this statement, they say Lam's arrogance revealed by her public responses have only poured fuel to the flame and lead to the crisis today. Lam is the culprit, they said. And this is one local legislator with a similar message. And it is very dangerous here, both for the uh, protesters and for the security guards and the police. So I urge Carrie Lam to really come out to speak to the people, to have a communication, to stop this uh, chaotic situation uh, first. Now this is very urgent. I saw the police were all inside the building, and they were with full gear and trying to defend, and they are not coming out, I don't know why. They are not here to control the situation. Now, those initial efforts I showed you to get into the parliamentary building were going on very close to where ceremonies to mark the handover from British to Chinese rule were also happening. So here we have the LegCo complex. Over here we have a convention and exhibition centre just along the waterfront. And Carrie Lam was in attendance there, as you can see from these pictures. Here she is walking in. And she had a message for the demonstrators. Ladies and gentlemen. What has happened in recent months has led to controversy and disputes between the public and the government. This has made me fully realize that I, as a politician, have to remind myself all the time of the need to grasp public sentiments accurately. I'm also fully aware that while we have good intentions, we still need to be open and accommodating. While the government has to ensure administrative efficiency, it still needs to listen patiently. Now let's move a little further on with events because there was a fresh storming of Parliament, this time with many more people showing up. These are some of the pictures showing this happening and you can see the crowd has got much, much bigger by this point. The protesters were smashing their way into the building using iron poles and guardrails. See this guardrail hill here that they'd picked up from nearby building sites. Once they'd got in, well, they started to vandalise the building itself. You can see graffiti on the walls and here they'd sprayed black paint on the Hong Kong emblem on one rear wall. Another protester raised a former British colonial flag bearing the Union Jack. And while this was happening, in the end, the police put out an ultimatum. They said the LegCo building's been violently attacked and the police will conduct sweeping in a short period of time and will take reasonable force. They also appealed to protesters to leave the vicinity. And within an hour, they had begun to move in. Nick Beek was there for that. The police are here. They haven't been for the last 12 hours or so, but they are now here in huge numbers. They've got their batons, they've got their helmets, they've got their shields. This is the police response that many were waiting for, and it hadn't arrived. Let's just see if we can press a little bit further on, because this is the place where thousands of protesters today took siege. They put up barricades. You could see the graffiti on the wall. They were here trying to break into different entrances and let's see if we can take you just inside let's go through here Danny so this is one of the government buildings normally this would be a highly secure area you can see it's been completely trashed printers there the whole place 
has been ripped apart. And if we just go out to one of these other entrances, this is the place where normally the politicians, the people who make the decisions in this city, would be coming to work every day. And if we just take you inside, this is where some of the protesters went through today. It's, it's an eerie silence, and there is a smell still in the air, and that's probably the tear gas that was fired. Just come with us a bit more. As you can see, these are probably other members of the media having the same idea as us, trying to get through, just listening to the police. You imagine at some point they will be making their way inside here. And look, more graffiti daubed on the wall. We're very much at the bottom of the building here. Um, I would assume the fact you've got so many numbers of officers here, there remains protesters nearby. And it's unclear at this point how many people remain in the chamber. But clearly the police are lining up. Oh, you can see, I mean, this is their training coming into operation now. They're making columns. This is normally, from experience of other riots I've been at, a prelude to action. So you haven't got the elite squad here all dressed in black, but you have got officers who normally would be walking the streets of Hong Kong, dealing with crime. Today, it looks like they're about to go in this way. We'll just see if we can try and get some sort of sense of where the operation will take us. I wonder at this point whether they will be bringing out the protesters through this exit. They're, they're clearly trying to keep some sort of entrance open. And now, you know, this is extremely fast moving. The police are being moved to one side. I think we're just going to stick with this and see what happens, Matthew. But, you know, I think a lot of people were amazed that this hadn't happened earlier today. Well, also inside that building was Fernando Chung, one of the legislators, and he accused the authorities of having laid a trap for the protesters. Police could have dispersed the demonstrators much earlier when they were trying to storm the electrical building. Uh, on the contrary, they did nothing except uh, uh, guarding from within. And uh, now the entire building, the uh, co legislative complex, is vacant. There's no security guard, there's no police. They purposefully allow the demonstrator to break into this building, uh, to vandalize it. And uh, I think this is a trap in that they want this type of scene to be seen by the uh, public. Uh, by doing so, they would earn back some of the public support, which has been overwhelmingly uh, siding with the demonstrators. Now, in the last half an hour, there's been a press conference by Carrie Lam and also uh, the head of police in Hong Kong. The police commissioner has said, I disagree that this was a trap. We had officers in the LegCo building for nearly eight hours. We were under siege. Protesters tampered with electricity. We were in fear of a blackout. He also went on to say they were in fear of being attacked. So lots of people have been suggesting this was a deliberate tactic, a trap being set for the protesters. The police have pushed back at that idea. Well, if that was the scene inside the LegCo building, when word got out that the police were arriving, well, the protesters decided to get out. Have a look at this picture from inside the main chamber in the parliamentary building, absolutely packed with protesters, but you can see some of them start to funnel out this way. And when they'd gone, all of them cleared out, none of them arrested, Nick Beek then got inside. The scenes speak for themselves really there's an eerie silence now you can see the complete mess there are these barriers which were used to ultimately get through the glass also umbrellas were used to shield protesters from uh, the pepper spray that the police had deployed but also they used it as a way of hiding their identities they were worried about the repercussions of coming in here this is extraordinary to think that normally this is the bustling beating heart of the the democratic process here in Hong Kong, but you know it's completely defaced. We've got wires falling from the walls there, graffiti all across the place. The protesters made their way in, they occupied here, and those are the steps that they went up to head to the chamber where they, you know, what followed, people could not believe. They sprayed graffiti on the walls, they also defaced some of the, the portraits of the politicians who've ruled this place for so long. And if we just go over here, Danny, if you're just able to come through here, you can see more of the barricades. This explains how they were able to get in. We saw these human...
conveyor belts, th this chain of people moving, moving these barriers forward, and they were using these tapes, these sort of things to, to tape them together, and it made a really effective battering ram. And crucially, the police did not stop them. And I think in the coming hours and days, people were saying, why did the police let it get to this? They were criticized a few weeks ago for not doing enough to try and stop the, the protesters in a peaceful way, in a more effective way. And I think today the pendulum has completely swung. They've stood back. And frankly, we have seen protesters run amok on the streets of Hong Kong today. Now, some members of Hong Kong's Legislative Council who aren't in the government have released a statement. I'll just pull out a couple of lines from it. Their ruthless and destructive behaviour amounts to a complete disregard of the law and has seriously undermined Hong Kong's fine tradition of the rule of law, they say. So more uh, political condemnation coming. Uh, let's hear one last report from Nick Beek. Again, talking through the next steps of this story. Well, Ross, we were asked to leave the chamber, that building that we were at just about half an hour ago, and the police have been moving through. They've been trying to assess the extent of the damage here. I mean, it's pretty obvious in broad terms to see the destruction here, but they're trying to look at individual rooms and work out uh, what has been done. So you can see a few officers here. We can try and wander um, further in. I think we might well get stopped. Is it possible to go further in? Are we able to? Okay, I think... Uh, that's a pretty uh, clear indication that we can't go any further, but you can see a few officers wading through the broken glass there, trying to pick up some of the debris. Of course, it will take months to, I'm uh, sorry, it will take a long, long time to try and clear all of this away, but it could be months or even years when you talk about the, the impact this may have on society here in Hong Kong. And that was a very strongly worded statement you read out there from the, the powers that be. And I can tell you, Ross, that we expect the chief executive, Carrie Lam, someone who's faced so much criticism over the past month or so. She is expected to give a press conference in about 40 minutes or so, I think, about four in the morning here. What she will say, we don't know. There have been huge, uh, you know, a huge chorus for her to resign, but it could well be that she comes out once again with this very strong message that the scenes uh, that played out today on the streets of Hong Kong was simply unacceptable. So it'll be interesting to see what is said at that press conference. Nick, did you manage to have many conversations with the protesters and ask them whether they feel they have the support of the many thousands of people who have protested peacefully? I, I did, and it was interesting. It was a bizarre conversation. One man was trying to smash his way into this building. He, he was holding a pole. He was surrounded by about 20 people. And I said, look, surely you're losing wider support by this sort of activity and he said no it's worked before because when the protests turned violent back in june carrie lamb came out and made a concession she said that this bill would be suspended so lots of people we spoke to today said they felt emboldened because violence had worked now whether that is the case or not that was certainly their sentiment so in terms of you know how they protest next that's that's hard to tell is it going to be more more of the same you can't imagine that the police would allow that to happen or will it be sort of phantom movements will people pop up occupy buildings as they have done over the past few weeks and will they try and continue what has been a very fluid protest movement well, Westbrook and Kerry Allen are still with me. Kerry, you were just commenting on the graffiti we could see there. Yeah, yeah, you just see the same words again and again repeated. Dog, 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 dog. Um, and dog official, dog government members, basically. Um, there's a lot of anger in Hong Kong about... Uh, about this this law still being suspended and um, you know there's a question of what's going to happen next I mean basically um, you know it's going to be a big cleanup operation to get rid of this graffiti mm -hmm. now um, so yeah everyone's right. watching the space yeah Laura any thoughts from you to finish the program reflecting on what Carrie Lam was saying in, in that press conference one of the biggest criticisms of her is her tone in press conferences the fact that she is out of touch with people and listening to that press conference she very much was digging in she wasn't giving an inch and it will be interesting to see how people in Hong Kong react to that both of you, we are indebted to your help for uh, guiding us through this program. Uh, of course, this story is not going anywhere. You'll get ongoing coverage of it via BBC World News if you're outside the UK and also uh, BBC News Channel if you're watching in the UK. There's lots of background information as well on the BBC News app and the BBC News website. But for Outside Source today, that's us done. We'll see you tomorrow at the same time. Bye-bye.
Well, as you heard there in James's report, lots of questions about exactly where this territory, where Hong Kong goes next in its struggle for democracy. On Monday, there were mass numbers of people out on the streets marking an annual march uh, for, to commemorate the handover of Hong Kong uh, to China, that anniversary. In that march was Dr. Man Kei Tam. I spoke to him uh, a little earlier. He's from Amnesty International, talking to him about how the violence builded up during the protests. First of all, we have to understand that um, the two groups of people, uh, one uh, are the majority of peaceful protesters and two are uh, the small group of people using violence yesterday, are, were originally one group um, and they are very consistent having um, the same demand, uh, the same cause towards uh, Carrie Lam, that is to withdraw the bill um, and to invest, uh, investigate what has happened uh, earlier in the, pro uh, in the protest um, about the use of po um, police, uh, uh, excessive force by the police and um, also ask Carrie Lam and the responsible officials to step down. So they are very consistent uh, on their demands um, um, on, both, on both groups. Right, but, but Dr. Tam, you know, we're looking at the images of the parliament building completely trashed by these protesters. Many in Hong Kong will be waking up this morning and wondering whether these young people, these demonstrators, have actually harmed their objective more than helped it. Mm. I think this is unfortunate that um, a small group of um, protesters use violence to achieve the, um, their aim, but um, we have, uh, this is definitely not justifiable from Amnesty's perspective, but we have to understand where their anger uh, c comes from. And um, over the past uh, few weeks, um, Carrie Lam hasn't responded to any uh, of the requests of the protesters. We are talking about um, million, one million, two million of people who took the street in the uh, past four weeks, and she didn't answer any of them. Dr. Man Kei Tam of Amnesty International in Hong Kong speaking to me a little earlier, talking about the anger and frustration amongst many in Hong Kong uh, and ex trying to explain how that led to the build-up of violence on Monday. Well, that was Nick Beek who managed to get into LegCo while those uh, protests were taking place. Laura Westbrook has just actually got back from Hong Kong. You were there for two weeks. You've literally just got off the plane. What do you make of what is happening now? I think what we've seen on Monday is uh, an explosion of anger on the streets in Hong Kong. One picture I saw on social media that I think kind of sums up the mood, it's a policeman looking at a pillar of graffiti and it said, we tried protesting, we tried peaceful protesting, it did not work. And I think that sums up the fact that a lot of protesters, especially these young protesters, have been saying that they've taken to the streets numerous times peacefully and they feel ignored by the government. They feel ignored by Carrie Lam, uh, who has been out of the public eye for the past 10 days and then appearing in this press conference at 4 a.m. in Hong Kong. And they feel ignored by her and they feel like they're ignoring her, um, the demands of the protesters protesters, which is to withdraw this bill. Um, and But whether the wider public in Hong Kong will support the level of violence that we're seeing today, which really is unprecedented. I've never seen a level of violence like that um, since I've been reporting on Hong Kong. Um, that really remains to be seen. Well, it's interesting you say that Carrie Lam, she did a disappearing act for nearly, nearly well, over a week, certainly. She was back. She made that press conference in the middle of the night and she criticised the protesters. She criticised the level of violence. She's really digging in here. She um, said quite crucially, I think, and quite repeatedly, that the Hong Kong was a lawful society, that it had a rule of law. And I think that gives you an indication into what might come next, which is that if these protests, and they are going to be characterized a riot, people face up to 10 years in prison. So Carrie Lam very much towing the party line here. But as Rupert was saying in his report, what many Hong Kongers are waking up today and this morning is a city that is divided, a city that is polarized, that two sides with these two very intractable positions, Carrie Lam on one side saying she would, she has suspended the bill, it will not be withdrawn, and the protesters saying they don't feel listened to by her and that they want this will with, 
and they want this, will, this bill withdrawn. And how do these two sides meet? I think many people in Hong Kong are going to be waking up and wrestling with what comes next for the city. Laura, thank you so much for getting off that plane, coming in straight away to talk to us. Thank you so much, Laura Westbrook, who's literally just back from Hong Kong. Well, that was Nick Beacon. As you saw, he got into LegCo. You could see the amount of damage there. I want to pick up on that particular point with Victoria Hugh. She's a fellow uh, at the U Institute for Asia and Asian Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Victoria, has the, have the protesters, have they undermined their cause by creating so much damage and destruction in LegCo? Well, this is obviously what the chief executive, Carrie Lam, wants to tell the world, and it's not for a very strange reason that she should hold a press conference at 4 a.m. Hong Kong time, because she wanted to make her narrative known to the entire uh, international media, uh, especially in the U.S. And, and in, in Europe. So this is one thing. But then we also have to look at what exactly the violence is done. There's a lot of graffiti, and people broke into, broke the glass doors, and then they also um, vandalized pictures of high officials. But to the mind, to the in the eyes of these young protesters, they were really trying to send a message. They feel that they have done everything. They've done one million strong march. They've done two million strong march. They have uh, blockaded the, the police headquarters. And three people, three young people had committed suicide. They seem to have done everything and they couldn't achieve anything. And so this is why they feel that they've been driven to desperation. And also, they have a model in mind that in 2014, before Hong Kong's umbrella movements, there was also the Sunflower Movement in Taiwan, where young people also stormed into the Legislative Council there. And then eventually, they were all released, they were all, but all the charges against them were dropped. Now, it's difficult to believe that if the Hong Kong police had wanted to stop those protesters from getting into LegCo, that they couldn't have stopped them. They could have stopped them, surely. Definitely. So over uh, the news today in Hong Kong that all the equal democracy legislatures accusing the police of using this for, uh, em empty fortress strategy. Essentially, if they had wanted to clear the site, they could have done so. And indeed, at midnight, when the police said, we're coming, they fight tear gas and clear the site, you know, within 15 minutes or so. And so why they would just step back? Essentially, they wanted to view all the protesters into the Legislative Council. There's another piece of evidence which is very interesting is that some um, young people, they look at the police announcement it was made at 9.30 p.m. and then the young protesters stormed into the Legislative Council building at 9 p.m. But the watch in the video was at 5.30 p.m. So it all sounds like it's a plan. Okay, Victoria, well, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Victoria Hugh from the University of Notre Dame, our thanks to you. So it looks like, once again, uh, we've seen that uh, the destruction, we saw the damage, the protesters. Uh, we heard from Carrie Lam. Karishma, uh, thank you so much for being across everything that's taking place in Hong Kong. Do stay with us here on BBC News to keep updated on events there. We're going to stay with our top story. Uh, Professor Chen Yushek is a political scientist and pro-democracy campaigner, and he joins us now uh, from Hong Kong. Professor, do you think the pro-democracy movement has been advanced over the last 24 hours? It is a setback, uh, and as we all know, the crisis has entered the stage of public opinion war. Certainly, the pro-democracy camp would like to make use of the sympathy for the movement to do well in the district council elections this November and the legislative council elections uh, in, uh, in September next year. Hopefully, Hong Kong people understand the frustration of a relatively small group of young people, and Hong Kong people also understand very well that the refusal to meet the very minimum demands of the public is not acceptable, namely the withdrawal, the clear -cut, a clear-cut withdrawal of the controversial bill and the initiation of an independent investigation into the alleged police violence on 
June the 12th. So I do believe that there is a lot of sympathy for the young people and still for the pro-democracy movement. But the episode certainly gave Beijing and the Kerry Lam administration to take a tough stand against the demands of the movement and Hong Kong people in general. Professor, is this a case of the young people wanting to move uh, faster, further and harder than some older generations in Hong Kong within the movement? Yes. Uh, there were already voices among these people, among these young people, that perhaps the peaceful approach, the non-violent approach may not work. They were certainly frustrated with the fact that uh, despite one million people marching in the streets on June the 9th, another two million people marching in the streets on June the 16th, yet the government still refused to meet their, their demands. And uh, they also believe that their successful surrounding of the Legislative Council buildings on June the 12th, uh, stopping meetings within the uh, Legislative Council meeting was instrumental in terminating the deliberations on the uh, controversial bill. So the, the frustration, the anger was obvious, were obvious. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Professor Cheng Yushek, thank you very much. Uh, and thank just to say that we will be continuing our coverage from Hong Kong in the... Well, we're going to stay with that now, because joining me is our former Hong Kong correspondent, Helia Chung, who has just got back from the territory. Uh, this has been simmering for much longer than the few weeks that some of us in the international community have been paying attention. Have, have tensions been rising over a longer period? Well, it's important to note that the um, particular protests on Monday have been unprecedented, and um, you'd say a lot of people in Hong Kong are quite shocked at what's happened. But it is true that young people in Hong Kong in particular have been unhappy for a very long time, and it has got worse in recent years. Because these are um, young people who've grown up since the handover. They've grown up, they've grown up being taught that Hong Kong has a one country, two systems, which means it has special rights distinct from mainland China. And they feel that these rights have been badly eroded over the last couple of years, and that they feel that Beijing has increased interference as well. So um, you'd say culturally there's also some dissatisfaction with mainland China, especially as they feel there's been an increased number of mainland Chinese tourists. And a lot of young people now feel that the comparatively peaceful protests of 2014 under the Umbrella movement have failed, and that's why they're taking a different approach. And with today's protests in particular, you'd say um, that a lot of it's been specifically about police violence, well, alleged police violence, where they feel that the police were um, excessively, used excessive force during the 12th of June protests, and they similarly feel that the government hasn't listened to them, and that seems to be what's driving them, um, what's happened on Monday. What you seem to be alluding to there is that there's almost a bit of a divide, a generational divide uh, between those who, who want to go further and who are angrier and, and, of course, the many who were just protesting peacefully. Yes, um, that's right. And, in fact, what's quite telling with the young protesters and the graffiti, the graffiti they left in the Legislative Council today was that someone had written, it was you who told us that peaceful protests wouldn't work. But we did see the divide even today where some of the um, older generation and the pro-democracy legislators tried to dissuade them from entering the Legislative Council, telling them that's a criminal offence, it might turn public opinion against you. But it seems like a lot of the protesters today, the younger ones, they, um, well, they simply felt so frustrated and they felt um, unhappy with them. They felt they weren't listened to. And that made them think, and some of them said, we don't care, we're going ahead. Uh, how have things changed since Xi Jinping took power? Well, since Xi Jinping took power, he's taken a noticeably harder line stance and a more nationalistic stance, not just with Hong Kong, but with wider China issues as well. But I mean, with Hong Kong, certainly under previous Chinese governments, we've seen them being more likely to um, offer certain concessions to, um, to pro-democracy campaigners or different groups in Hong Kong, whereas that definitely hasn't been the case under Xi Jinping. Of course, the Chinese government would argue that the Hong Kong government did allow some concessions in this case. At least it said it would pause the unpopular bill. And clearly that has been enough for some of the protesters. Helia, really good to get your analysis. Thank you very much. That's our correspondent Nick Beek there, who was uh, talking to me earlier on right inside the chamber of the uh, Parliament building there in Hong Kong. Well, let's go live now to Hong Kong and speak to Rosalind Adams, Asia correspondent for BuzzFeed News. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Rosalind. What are your impressions of this very dramatic day in Hong Kong? Um, yeah, it was super dramatic. I was outside the Legislative Council building watching this 
um, you know, slow break in, go hour by hour. There, you know, there's just a lot of determination in the protesters. I think there's a feeling that um, they don't know what other options are left. Every time, you know, they've been very consistent about their demands. Um, and every time Carrie Lam has held a press conference, um, there's been partial retreats, but not enough to make protesters happy. And I think, you know, they're just doing everything they can think of at this point. Were you surprised when they went into the chamber of the Legislative Council and, and they, you know, they yeah. daubed graffiti all over it, as we've seen? Yeah, it was definitely surprising. I mean, I was standing outside there for hours and they were, like, as the hours went by, they were, you know, taking down glass panes one by one and just super methodical about it, bringing in supplies, um, different metal barricades, sledgehammers, basically anything they could use to get their way in. Um, they took the precaution to smash CCTV cameras um, right outside the Legislative Council, like that entrance. Um, everybody's definitely concerned about um, surveillance and, and being identified in these protests. Um, but, you know, once they got that metal barricade open, I, I was surprised to see like hundreds just file in. I, you know, it wasn't clear if it was going to be a small group, um, but it was really a mass occupation of the Legislative Council building. And, you know, as, as one protester said to me, he was like, this is a huge step for us. Um, you know, if we can get inside this building, it means the government has to listen to us. So I think it felt like a big symbolic victory to protesters. Uh, just tell us a bit more about who these protesters are, that most of them are students, is that right? Yeah, a lot of them are students, they're university students. Um, and, you know, at every time, you know, you know, there have been points where somebody will take the megaphone and, and corral people and pass information on. Um, but it really is leaderless. And every time I've talked to people asking them their affiliation or if they belong to some group or um, they're, they all are like, no, this is, it's not like that. We all have the same voice. Um, this is really a leaderless movement. Uh, we're sharing information. We're not telling people what to do. Um, even inside the Legislative Council building, there was a decision about should we stay or should we go? Um, and the way that protesters were talking about it was all we can do is share the information. We know police are coming, but if people want to stay, they're going to stay. Um, but it's, you know, I think there's just a lot of, um, you know, unity, I think, around the, the anger that these protests uh, are, are representing right now. And when, we, when you talk about anger, what exactly are they angry about? Is it specifically this extradition, proposed extradition law that would ultimately see suspects extradited to mainland China, or is it more than that? Um, you know, I think it's definitely more than that. That has become a huge symbol but of China's encroachment on Hong Kong um, and, you know, er the erosion of certain freedoms in, in Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, one person said to me, like, we still have our freedom of speech. We're going to keep speaking out um, as long as we can. Um, but I think that's why they are so um, being so steadfast in these goals uh, to um, fully stop the extradition bill, to have Carrie Lam step down, um, and to have the release of all protesters that have been arrested. Um, is just because they see that as holding on to what they already have. I think there's a bigger push behind all this for more democracy in Hong Kong, but I really do think that's why people aren't, aren't stepping down is because they just don't want to lose any more freedoms than what they already have lost. And a bigger push, as you say, for more democracy, but what is likely to be the response of the authorities? Carrie Lam, um, the, the chief executive, is she going to give way to all of that? Um, and, and, and what does... What is Beijing going to make of all of this? They must, I mean, in, in Beijing, they must be horrified by what they've seen. Yeah, I mean, definitely there's been censors. The censors in China ha have, you know, been very robust uh, of the protests here. Um, you know, every time Carrie Lam, there's been some retreat, but every time Carrie Lam has given a press conference, really the most she's done is apologize. There hasn't been um, a, you know, a... a she hasn't really addressed the protesters' demands, and that's why I think we keep seeing this, these like tensions ramp up and these greater, um, these greater efforts to like get their get voices heard. Um, so yeah, it's very unclear what's going to happen. I think there's a lot of um, 
you know, stubbornness on both sides. I, you know, I don't think the Hong Kong government wants to look weak, um, but we're going to hear from Carrie Lam in a, in a few minutes. She's going to give a press conference, so I guess we'll see see what she says and maybe have some more insight into, into what will happen next. Uh, Rosalind Adams, thank you very much indeed. Asia correspondent for BuzzFeed News, thanks for being with us. And um, yeah. we were just talking about Carrie Lam there. We are expecting a news conference with her uh, in the next few minutes. We'll bring you that live here on BBC News.